welcome everybody to today's Methods Matters webinar entitled Patient Reported Outcome Measures Prompts for False Prevention, presented by Jennifer Davis and Daria Tai. And my name is Belinda Jampo, and the uh, webinar today will be moderated by Craig Mitten. Um, on the back end today, helping me out with everything uh, is Amber Huey from the Methods Clusters as well. So the Methods Matters webinars are actually a monthly webinar series. Uh, from the BC Support Unit's methods clusters, and it showcases emerging research and patient-oriented research methods. Um, we do actually have a hashtag today that you guys can use to share your thoughts with us um, on this webinar via Twitter. And as you guys can see, that's Methods Matters. So you are definitely encouraged to use that to share your thoughts with us on this webinar. Before we start anything, I would like to acknowledge the ancestral tradition and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Sabertooth, and Squamish nations from whose traditional lands the BC Support Unit operates in. Um, so here we actually do encourage an attitude of continuous learning, and that means approaching new ideas and diverse perspectives with openness, respect, and curiosity. So our aim here is to center pre um, previously underprivileged voices. Thanks, Belinda, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Craig Mitten here uh, from the School of Population and Public Health at UBC, uh, and it is my pleasure to moderate today's session. I'm just going to briefly introduce the two speakers, turn it over to them, and then we will come back uh, in about 35, 40 minutes for a Q&A uh, moderated discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce Daria Tai, who has a BSc from UBC and is a research assistant in the Falls Prevention Clinic at VGH. And also Dr. Jennifer Davis, who is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Management at UBCO in Kelowna. And she is the co-director of research and operations at the Falls Prevention Clinic. So Daria and Jennifer, over to you to take it away. Great, thanks so much, Craig, for the introduction. And thanks so much, everyone, for coming to engage today on the topic of patient-reported outcome measures and examining how um, patient-reported outcome measures may play a role in supporting adherence in a primary care setting, specifically the Falls Prevention Clinic. So just to provide a brief overview today, uh, Daria and I will be co-presenting on a project that's really a first step in addressing the broader question of, is there an opportunity for health gains and cost savings by using patient reported outcome measures to support adherence? So in this initial step that we took forward to answer this question, we explored a novel primary care setting, the Falls Prevention Clinic, um, alongside patient partners to really try and gain a deeper understanding of patients' perspectives on a specific prom, the EQ5D, and how they think it may or may not play a role in supporting adherence. So just to give some context to PROMs in the context of primary care clinical settings. Now, if we're looking historically, we know that patient reported outcome measures are, are self-assessments of various aspects of patient's health status. And historically, these have been used primarily in research settings. But over the last decade, uh, patient reported outcome measures have been gaining a lot of traction and are gaining increased recognition for their potential role in various primary care settings. So some examples to consider are, um, uh, can really range in primary care, but PROMS can be used as a screening tool to customize patient education, as well as customizing um, physician feedback to patients. And in the context of older adults, it's also shown, been shown to improve some aspects of medical care. Um, such as providing patients with greater assistance for functional or clinical problems, as well as providing patients themselves with a better understanding of threats to their own health. Um, so we do have some reason to, to believe that there may be some sustained benefits to patients themselves from PROMS implementation in, in primary care. Now, important component to highlight of these benefits is the patient-physician um, communication. And we know that PROMS may positively impact clinical management through the shared decision-making of patients and practitioners. And really the effectiveness of various interventions or treatments um, largely depends on, on the, the level of communication and the quality of communication. 
So now taking a specific dive into the Falls Prevention Clinic, um, I'll just take a moment to provide a brief overview of falls. So we know that falls are very costly. In the US alone, we know that um, falls cost um, in excess of $50, 50 billion annually, and that includes both fatal and non-fatal falls. Um, in BC alone, we know that data indicate that over the past decade, hospitalization rates um, remain relatively constant. So, so we know that falls are continuing to impose um, uh, an, a burden on the healthcare system, both in terms of costs and consequences. But the good news is that we have effective strategies to prevent falls. And one of these effective strategies that has been demonstrated through evidence on the international level is a multimodal falls prevention clinic that is physician based. And what we know from the evidence is that a multimodal falls prevention clinic can um, basically prevent the incidence of falls by up to 40%. And it does so by addressing individuals, individualized risk factors for falling. And so a series of recommendations are often made from the falls clinic that may include medication adjustments as well as various lifestyle um, interventions that may include exercise prescription. Now, what we've noticed is that um, one factor that may impede patients from getting the full benefit of the intervention delivered in the falls clinic is low to average adherence, particularly on lifestyle or behavioral interventions. So this really led us to thinking more about, you know, how we might promote adherence and, and perhaps there's a potential role for patient reported outcome measures um, in this kind of underexplored area within the context of falls prevention. What we do know from the literature is that Patients are less likely to complete a patient reported outcome measure if they're not able to perceive or understand the value. And so this led us to our primary objective was really to um, examine how patient reported outcome measures, specifically we looked at the EQ 5D 5L prom, um, may play a role in supporting patients' adherence to the recommendations that patients receive well um, being assessed at the Falls Prevention Clinic. So I'm just gonna take a moment to provide a brief overview of, of what a Falls Prevention Clinic assessment and care looks like. So the Falls Prevention Clinic at Vancouver General Hospital is a geriatrician led multidisciplinary clinic that really focuses on assessing an individual's risk factors for falls. So it includes a comprehensive medical examination delivered by a geriatrician to identify risk factors for falling. So looking at this schematically, um, individuals come in for their initial appointment and they receive a comprehensive um, series of assessments uh, addressing cognitive domains, physical function, as well as a comprehensive geriatric exam. And at baseline, all individuals who come in also complete the EQ5D 5L prom. So step one at the Falls Prevention Clinic is really focused on first identifying what the individual's risk factors are that are increasing the risk of falling. And step two, once we've identified these risk factors, is really focusing on prevention. So here we're talking about secondary prevention meaning we want to prevent that next fall from happening. And how we do this is we address risk factors to prevent future falls. And so all of these assessments collectively are reviewed by the team and then recommendations are made that may include referrals to other healthcare professionals, um, as well as prescription of um, lifestyle interventions that may include diet modification, um, exercise, um, home safety assessment, um, many different things that play a role. And really the focus is to address factors that, that can be changed. So we wanna focus on modifiable factors. Um, often as well, some tests or investigations are ordered and then a follow-up is based on the geriatrician decision on whether or not the patient um, would need to be followed again. 
So based on these recommendations, this is really where adherence comes in and really to obtain full benefit of the uh, intervention offered within the context of the Falls Clinic, it's really important to, to promote adherence. So here is kind of a collective summary of what I've just described. And what I'll highlight here is part of this is a vision and part of this is reality. And I'll kind of highlight that as we go. Um, so part of what I'll detail is where we're hoping to go and, and first I'll detail where we're at. So all patients who are seen at the Falls Clinic are originally referred by a referring physician. They come in for their baseline assessment. They complete the EQ5D at baseline along with the other comprehensive battery I mentioned. And based on these assessments, they are provided with individualized recommendations. And then based on the discretion of the geriatrician, they are then followed up generally at six or 12 months. And this information is fed back to the referring physician as well. Now, currently the proms are not done in real time in the Falls Clinic, um, but that is the future goal. And so ideally we would have as well feedback to patients themselves, as well as feedback on patient's health status back to the referring physician. So now just taking a moment to give an overview of the methods. We uh, conducted this study out of the Vancouver Falls Prevention Clinic and patient partnership um, was really a key aspect of our research team throughout the study. So we had uh, all of our patient partners both had lived experiences with at least one fall, um, as well as lived experiences with experiencing care directly from the Falls Prevention Clinic. We conducted a series of semi-structured interviews that included focus groups of sizes between four and six um, participants. And I'll go through data analysis in a few moments. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the patient partnerships. Um, really, uh, we're grateful to have very active um, patient partners as part of this research project. And the patient partners we had contributed to um, study design, focus, question development. We went through a series of iterations with our patient partners and they provided feedback on um, um, their perceptions of what questions we're asking as well as, as their perceptions on the clarity of the questions and what questions might be important to them. Um, we also had patient partners. So one patient partner volunteered to attend uh, each of the focus groups. And we also met with the patient partner after the focus groups to, to gain their um, further feedback and insights. Now, one thing that became a learning curve for us during the study was, um, you know, working with patient partners who um, were often frail due to a number of medical comorbidities. And so um, we had one patient partner who um, was not able to continue with the study. And because of this, we developed a rolling recruitment of new patient partners um, when current patient partners were unwell. And so we had one new patient partner join partway through the study um, where we onboarded this patient partner and, and provided the patient partner with existing history of the project. So the focus group questions that and the prompts are included directly below, but just to provide a way of, of summary here, we, we asked um, participants, first of all, how they thought the EQ5D might be helpful. We also asked them about their feelings about timing of the feedback, so frequency, um, how often, and they provided their thoughts on that. And we also asked about uh, their thoughts on tracking health status over time. So for this, we actually um, gave participants a sample graph that would show um, the EQ5 state, EQ5D status over time and ask them um, what they thought about that type of information. And we also asked them about thinking what might happen if they don't adhere or what might happen if they do adhere to just gain their, their global thoughts on adherence. Um, comparatively at the Falls Clinic, all participants actually receive um, an individualized fall risk assessment. And so um, from their physiological fall risk, they actually um, 
receive a, a graph with their individual risk compared to an average population um, of their comparable with their baseline demographic characteristics. And so we asked them if, if this type of information using the EQ5D um, that assesses their health status, um, if they would find that useful and why or why not. Um, and then moving more towards the topic of adherence, we asked what information they would need to promote their adherence to Falls Clinic recommendations globally. And then moving more specifically into asking how they think the EQ5D might fit in terms of promoting their adherence. So participant responses were analyzed according to the three stages of qualitative analysis outlined by Strauss and Corbin. So for open coding, we identified main concepts and for axial coding, um, it's involved sorting and condensing the codes identified in the open coding process. And then for selective coding, we established a final set of overarching themes, which Daria will take us through now. So over to you, Daria. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so as Jen mentioned before, uh, we were able to recruit three active patient partners at the time of the study. Uh, we had 21 participants in total, uh, with their mean age being around 81. Around three quarters of the participants were female and their mean PPA score was around 1.2, which indicates a moderate risk of falling. Uh, their mean MOCA score shows that the participants were just on the cusp of the spectrum for mild cognitive impairment. And these characteristics are quite um, indicative of the typical population that we see at the Falls Clinic. So I'm going to go over some of the key themes that emerged as well as the uh, main quotes that uh, many participants agreed with. Uh, so again, we first asked uh, the participants how they thought the EQ5D5L may be helpful for them. And uh, here we already see that um, a sort of a common pattern uh, that we've, we saw throughout each prompt where there seems to be kind of two distinct types of um, positions held by certain subgroups of participants. Uh, those who tend to identify that the usefulness of the measure for the patients themselves and those who tend to identify the usefulness of the measures for more for their healthcare providers. Uh, so for this prompt, um, two higher level uh, themes kind of emerged. Uh, one was opportunity and second was development. Um, so many of the participants um, identified the opportunity of, um, of the measure giving them increased self-awareness. And this could be um, in the form of bringing up any issues that the, the patients themselves may have overlooked. Um, there was also an opportunity for um, using the measure to delineate any indiv individualized trends uh, of their well being before and after going into the clinic. And they also uh, identified that um, this can uh, give them the opportunity to uh, give their health care providers a more in depth um, perspective of their own, um, of how they see their conditions or um, their comorbidities and how it impacts their daily living for their, part, for their provider. Um, and in turn, they, they believe that the, their healthcare provider can use this information to better individualize their treatment plans. Uh, so the uh, key quotes that came up when discussing opportunity, uh, one of the participants said, uh, we understand that it could be different tomorrow or yesterday and that we'll be doing this each time we're here. So you get a sense of the progress or the fluctuations of your healing process. Then I think it could be very interesting. 
And when uh, they were discussing a development, one patient said, uh, providers should make recommendations on the basis of what they've observed in the tests that are done, and also in terms of the individual's approach to what the patient thinks. Um, so for the second prompt, we asked about their feelings regarding the timing and um, of the feedback and also the administration of the EQ5D5L. And um, overwhelmingly, we um, heard that the patients would like to receive feedback in a real-time basis. And this was uh, important to them because they believe that um, they would like to understand what the results of the measures mean for them right soon after they complete um, the measure. And uh, as well, there was a general consensus that um, administrating the questionnaire more often is more helpful as this could better capture their, uh, the dynamic nature of their uh, healing process. Um, so a couple of the key quotes that came up, uh, one participant said, I just found that it is helpful uh, to have the person tell me how I respond to them on that particular day. And another participant said, uh, I think having it done more often is a good thing because I think each week or each month you may be worse or you may be better. The first week you can walk about and then the next month you've fallen or something's happened and you can't do that. So yeah, I think this is very useful. Um, and Again, for the third prompt, we showed them a, um, a sample graph of a uh, sample EQ5D5L trajectory over time. And we asked about uh, their thoughts on how this type of information might be helpful for them or, and how um, they may relate that to adherence behaviors. Um, so here we also, we again really see the two different types of directions that uh, certain participants go, um, go down. And uh, so those who thought that the measures may be quite helpful for patients uh, talk more about the benefits. Um, and so two of the main uh, points when discussing the benefits of using this type of graph, um, they mentioned uh, comparison and motivation. So um, with, in terms of comparison, they were able to, they think that they're able to use the information of how, uh, how their um, progress, how they are prog progressing over time. And they mentioned that they really valued the visual aspect of seeing that type of information. And together with a discussion with their provider, it could potentially help them better help them understand their treatment process. And um, they can, they mentioned that they can also use this kind of information for motivation if they see that they're um, improving or if they're declining, um, they can maybe adjust their behavior to change or maintain uh, what they see. Um, so for those who uh, believe more, it was believe that this measures more for the provider, they discussed about the, the challenges that can come with this uh, type of presentation. And um, so two main points were, were the presentation of the data itself may be confusing for some patients um, who may not be um, quite well versed in looking at kind of data driven uh, figures. And this brought up the discussion about um, whether this type of information may be more useful for healthcare providers and uh, for researchers rather than for patients themselves. And so some of the main quotes that I came from discussing the benefits. Uh, someone said, I would expect improvement. That's what I would like my graph to look like. My expectation would be that if I am reasonably compliant, I progress. 
and hopefully it would shame me if I didn't progress. Um, and when they discussed about the challenges, someone said, um, it doesn't make any sense when you just look at it unless the provider starts talking about what caused that decline. And uh, someone else also mentioned that I think this is more for staff who are taking care of me if they need to know. Um, and for the fourth prompt, we asked about if asked about how they would feel if we provided them comparative information on how they are doing in uh, uh, relative to their peers. And uh, so two higher level themes um, emerged from here where they talked about the relevance of this type of data and the usefulness of this kind of data. And um, again, we see the two kind of diverging um, viewpoints about uh, the usefulness where um, some believe it was more for the provider. And uh, these participants tended to believe that the, uh, this type of information was not so relevant for them because they believe that they know their own health status, they know how they feel, they feel and they um, don't really believe that comparing to other uh, other patients who may have vastly different um, health conditions may be that useful for them because they felt that it might, it's sort of comparing apples and oranges. Um, and for those who believe that it could be useful for patients, they kind of reiterated the recurring um, themes about motivation and self-awareness. And again, if they uh, have a discussion with their provider, they can figure out why they belong in a certain group. Um, and so the key quote that emerged when um, discussing about how it could be relevant to patients. Someone said, personally, I'm not interested in how I'm measuring up against other people. I'm interested in my own goals of falling less or injuring myself less or having a better quality of, of life or whatever. <laughs> so for me, this isn't going to help me comply. And on the other hand, there's the, um, when they were talking about how it could be actually useful for the patient, someone said, um, I probably would change my approach to my recommendations. I would probably ask a bit more questions when I was there as to why I was not considered in the moderate group, even though I considered I was. But when I find out I'm not, I would like to know what it is that I can help myself with. And for the uh, fifth prompt, we asked about what other types of information uh, patients might need uh, to promote their adherence to the clinic recommendations outside of the scope of the EQ5D5L. Um, so there are a number of different ideas here and I'll highlight what the majority agreed with. Um, so communication with the healthcare provider was a prominent theme or factor under all of the, these higher level themes. So it seems that direct feedback on participant or patient adherence was um, suggested as uh, a performance metric uh, and having direct discussions about that rather than the results that kind of may come from their um, current behaviors may be more uh, useful for them. Um, and additionally, uh, patient knowledge was um, mentioned uh, about, uh, so patient knowledge that may be um, acquired through self-reflection, so giving them prompts to think about why they may not have been complying might be useful. So again, highlighting that direct kind of approach regarding adherence. And, um, and some also talked about how um, getting to know um, 
their comorbidities at um, a higher level and how, um, so that's more in terms of how their comorbidities or their specific comorbidities may be hindering their compliance. Um, so to highlight um, about kind of the direct conversations that patients seem to value, um, one, per one patient said, um, I think that would be a direct question that could result in this or adherence. And if we aren't compliant, why? Do we need encouragement? Do we need different programs? Why are we not feeling well? And that's questions we can ask ourselves because I think the whole idea is to improve our quality of life. Um, and um, again, to highlight how um, kind of direct prompts may help them um, reflect why they might not have been complying. Um, someone said, if you had a fall, there may be a volunteer who could call in and say, hey, what's happening? Are you recovering? Or how did you fall? Can you see any way to stop yourself? Have you learned anything? Um, asking those questions might be an encouragement. And I just know that I've been here three times. I sometimes would have liked to have been uh, called in. Instead, I want to ask a question. But there didn't seem to be a resource I can do that. And finally, we asked about uh, how the EQ5D5L may could fit in to promoting their adherence. So again, this is reiterating the pattern of the, the two different directions that the participant tends to fall under. Um, so for those who believe that the EQ5D5L may not have a role in, in affecting their behavior, they talked about, um, again, knowing already knowing their state of well-being or um, already having an increased self-awareness of how, how they're doing. And um, they also believed more that this could be more uh, helpful for their provider. Um, and for those who uh, explained about how it could uh, help their um, health behaviors, they uh, talked about how um, using the information or the results from the this measure can help improve their self-awareness and um, they uh, and it could be a source of positive reinforcement for them if they are able to see that they are progressing throughout their visits um, with their healthcare providers. So to, to highlight these two points or these two different kind of um, perspectives. Uh, someone who um, talked about already knowing their own state of well being said, In my personal case, I don't think I pay much attention to it because I know how I feel. Uh, you know inside how you're feeling. And while um, the other side of uh, participants who believed it could help them change their behavior, uh, someone said, uh, the reason I want to see the long-term answer sheets is I'm curious to know whether the exercise program that I've put myself through is changing any of these answer as the year progresses. And so that seems to me that that would give really good feedback <clears throat> for adherence. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so from what we gathered uh, from this project, uh, we really see the importance of patient physician communication as it was mostly emphasized throughout every prompt. Um, it really highlights the, the importance of providing productive feedback to help facilitate the patient understanding of uh, what the results of these patient out reported outcome measures mean for them. And this increased uh, communication with their providers can help give context to um, what these uh, results may mean for them. And uh, this in turn can help greatly with uh, promoting their own self-awareness, which plays quite a promising role in their um, uh, their adherence levels or their health behaviors. 
Uh, another key point is that uh, we see that patient experiences are quite dynamic and uh, patient reported outcome measures should be recorded quite frequently to capture this. Um, the participants also um, recognize how vastly different their own health experience can be compared to others. And so it's highlighted throughout that um, it's valuable to ask direct questions about what they may need to help promote their adherence. And uh, finally, many participants really see how these patient reported outcome measures can be of value for healthcare providers um, by helping them gain their um, the patient's perspectives on how they are doing and how it might be affecting their daily living. And um, they can use this information to help um, increase, again, the patient's self-awareness and help and assist the providers in um, directing more individualized treatment plans. Great, thanks, Saria. So to, to conclude, I'll just take a brief moment to highlight some continuing directions that we are taking um, in light of the findings of the project. So um, in the future, we do hope to explore the real-time use of patient-reported outcome measures in the falls prevention clinic setting. And um, I, you know, a, a post component of this would be ascertaining the impact of using PROMS in real time on on adherence and tracking the, the cost consequences as well as the incidence of falls um, to see if, if this has an impact. Um, I'd also like to um, really thank the amazing village that supported this project. Um, so our first uh, row of pictures is the team um, for, for this project that was uh, supported by the BC support unit, the health economics and uh, simulation methods cluster, um, as well as our patient partners who were actively um, included in the study, and um, as well as the entire team and staff at the Falls Prevention Clinic. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, the mentors for the project who you can see in, in the second row who, who have provided ongoing um, mentorship, which uh, we are very grateful for. So thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Daria, for an uh, for excellent uh, presentation, very clear and, uh, and outlined very well what you were doing with PROMS and, uh, and how that uh, fits within the Falls uh, Clinic. I'm wondering, um, uh, Jennifer and Daria, maybe come back on video so we can see you both, and I'll just kick it off by just, just asking, maybe you could talk a little more about the patient partners. Um, how are they involved in the, the study, and uh, what specifically did, did they uh, bring to the project. Hey, thanks, thanks, Craig, for the question. Um, so the patient partners were uh, recruited uh, during the grant um, grant development study question development phase of the project. Um, so they they were involved at the outset um, to um, basically help guide direction of our our question. Um, as well as they, they played a very strong role in the, um, the wording of the question, the, the kind of the content of the question. So um, you might have noticed that we, we kind of had some broader questions about adherence more generally. Um, and some of this was from some patient partner feedback about, well, it's not just one thing um, that, you know, one tool is not going to fix our, our adherence. So um, it was a suggestion of, of collectively broadening some questions and then providing narrowing. So um, I think it can look like a lot of questions, but what we found was that there was a preference um, uh, with um, having our patient partners uh, work with us on the questions to have uh, more questions, um, slightly shorter questions, um, and um, and kind of questions that were were broad and then more specific. So a bit of variety there. Um, Daria, you may want to comment um, just on some of the onboarding strategy that you used as well. Um, given that we had uh, kind of a mid-study turnover with, with a new patient partner? Yeah, um, and just to uh, address some the 
parts of the question, the previous question. Um, yeah, the patient partners uh, played a large role in, um, yeah, the wording of the question. So really clarifying um, or even simplifying some of the questions that we uh, initially uh, proposed. And so they uh, were really able to kind of finalize the um, questions so that it's more digestible for, for, um, for the actual interviews. Um, in terms of the onboarding um, strategies, uh, we, um, we were, you know, I think the main um, strategy was to, um, uh, there are certain patients that come through the clinic who are quite enthusiastic about uh, research opportunities and, um, and they, a lot of them want to kind of give back to the clinic um, since it's really, uh, for some of them really impacted um, their, their lives. So they're quite grateful for the clinic and um, they're, we're very, um, yeah, enthusiastic to um, take part of, 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 um, and research opportunities. So we're able to contact um, some of those um, and some of those patients who uh, seem to be more um, more uh, more energetic about this. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Um, some questions are starting to roll in uh, in the Q and A. Uh, so others, if you do want to add to that, uh, hopefully we'll have time to get to a, a number of these questions. Please put your questions in the, uh, in the Q&A. Um, one question that's come in uh, is around other contexts where PROMS potentially has been used as a tool to support uh, uh, patient adherence. So are you aware of other contexts uh, where this has happened um, and or can you envision other contexts where this, this might be able to happen? Hey, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think that um, in terms of using those results um, from this study, it, it does appear that there's promise. Um, I probably couldn't say fully that we know that yet because um, our next step is really um, tracking change of adherence over time. Um, and seeing if it does change, first of all, and then seeing if that change impacts falls. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my suggestion in terms of considering other health areas might be um, to, to follow that approach. So um, at first kind of step one, gaining an understanding of um, the viewpoints of of patients um, have towards PROMS in the context of whatever um, uh, healthcare setting you're looking at. And, and then knowing that, that can actually help inform how you would implement PROMS within that primary care setting. Um, and then, then step three would be to actually um, track any changes in, in patient outcomes that are key outcomes within that, within that setting. So have you seen this elsewhere or was this, you know, you guys at the Falls Clinic coming up with this as an idea of how to use PROMS? You know, I haven't um, seen this specifically related to adherence elsewhere, but if, um, if the individual who asked that question is aware, I'd certainly be uh, keen to have a conversation about that. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, it also strikes me a little bit around um, uh, why would you expect that PROMS or EQ5D particularly might be different than a clinical measure? because um, you could envision a clinical measure with this kind of tracking and this kind of frequency being used in a similar way. Did you expect that, uh, would you expect that PROMS would give different insight for the, the patient around adherence? Yeah, you know, um, kind of, that's a really interesting, um, you know, question. And I think we've, we've had conversations about this within our, within our team. And it, it's kind of, um, we're kind of talking about the idea that you know, uh, a prom tool is is fairly quick to administer. So, um, and and so it's really meant to be a complement 
Um, because it's quick, it can be done in, in five minutes. It can quickly highlight, you know, if there's problems with mobility, um, usual activities, self-care, pain, depression. So it's almost that um, more like a rapid test, um, you know, in the area era of COVID, um, you know, it's more like a rapid indicator of some problems that may then serve as a potential probe for, for further inquiry. Um, you know, it's certainly not meant to replace uh, any type of clinical assessment, but, but more just meant to help um, provide a little bit of uh, insight or something maybe even the patient might not have brought up in their clinical visit with their geriatrician. So sometimes it's just meant to basically provide a, a compliment without adding um, a lot of additional burden. Yep, totally. No, that's good. Do you have any thoughts on, um, on using uh, an online uh, type approach or an app um, for the proms uh, as opposed to uh, uh, doing it paper-based? Right, so um, we, that's also, um, you know, a point of discussion, um, you know, currently not all of our um, participants or individuals that come to the Falls Clinic uh, are familiar with doing things online, completing questionnaires online. Um, I think we'll see kind of a growing trend of increasing famil familiarity um, as, as our current population ages. Uh, but a reason that we have kind of maintained the prom being done in the clinic is that um, we can answer any questions that come up um, with regard to, to patients completing them. And it also just um, ensures that we have a, a higher percentage of completion rate as well. Um, so those are kind of some of the primary reasons that we've been doing it uh, at their in-person assessment. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the online, the virtual app idea is, you know, a, a great area to explore as well. Yeah, it could even be something extending into some, you know, home health monitoring um, aspects when you start talking about apps in that context. Um, certainly in the user friendliness of a, of a tool like uh, EQ5D is, is so self-explanatory. Um, one of the questions that came in uh, on the chat, uh, how or why did you choose the EQ5D um, specifically and did you consider other quality of life surveys? Right, so we, um, we did choose the EQ5D um, uh, specifically because we uh, had previously demonstrated its construct validity in, the pro in this population. Um, and it's also a, a widely used measure that has Canadian valuations. Um, so we, we chose it on, on that basis. Um, and as well, it, it does involve minimal uh, additional participant burden to complete it. Um, comparatively with with some other measures so so those are some of the primary reasons why why we chose it yeah that's great perfect well i'm not seeing anything else coming in in the uh in the chat or the q a uh so i think we will wrap up unless i'm gonna get a nod from anyone oh i do see one more that's just popped up um what is the BC healthcare system cost due to accidental falls or falls in general? Just off the top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it, we, we don't have um, that I'm aware of, uh, I would say most recent figures in the last couple of years um, published in peer reviewed literature for that. But uh, from, I guess, from recollection, um, we are looking at over $150 million in injurious fall related expenses uh, for older adults, but that, that estimate is slightly dated. So, um, and there's also been some changes in the, the um, ICD codes. And so I believe that um, there are some issues with interpreting changes over time as well um, with regard to the cost data. 
Good. Uh, so, Darian, Jennifer, thank you very much for uh, providing this uh, session for uh, us. It's really fascinating uh, use of prompts, and uh, I think it's generating some interest uh, in a number of different areas for people extending beyond the, the falls area. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll call us to close there. Thank you again, and uh, wish everyone uh, a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.